If you would, open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 42 this morning. We're going to go back to the book of Genesis today. I want to start this morning with a story, one of my, one of my favorite stories. Alice Grayson was to bake a cake for the Baptist Church Ladies Group Bake Sale in Tuscaloosa, but she forgot to do it until the last minute. She remembered, remembered it the morning of the bake sale, and after rummaging through cabinets, she found an angel food cake mix and quickly made it while drying her hair, dressing and helping her son Brian pack up for scout camp. But when Alice took the cake from the oven, the center had dropped flat, and the cake was horribly disfigured. She said, oh dear, there's no time to bake another cake. The cake was so important to Alice because she did so want to fit in to her new church and in her new community of new friends. So being inventive, she looked around the house for something to build up the center of the cake. Alice found it in the bathroom, a roll of toilet paper. She plunked it in and then covered it with icing. Not only did the finished product look beautiful, it looked perfect. Before she left the house to drop the cake by the church and head for work, Alice woke her daughter, Amanda, and gave her some money and specific instructions to be at the bake sale the minute it opened at 9.30 and to buy that cake and bring it home. When the daughter arrived at the sale, she found that the attractive, perfect cake had already been sold. Amanda grabbed her cell phone and called her mom. Alice was horrified. She was beside herself. Everyone would know. What would they think? Oh, my, she wailed. She would be ostracized, talked about, ridiculed. All night, Alice lay awake in bed, thinking about people pointing their fingers at her and talking about her behind her back. The next day, Alice promised herself that she would try not to think about the cake, and she would attend the fancy luncheon bridal shower at the home of a friend of a friend and try to have a good time. Alice did not really want to attend because the hostess was a snob who more than once had looked down her nose at the fact that Alice was a single parent and not from the founding families of Tuscaloosa. But having already committed, she could not think of a believable excuse to stay home. The meal was elegant. The company was definitely upper crust Old South and to Alice's horror, the cake in question was presented for dessert. Alice felt the blood drain from her body when she saw the cake. She started to get out of her chair and rushed and tell her hostess all about it. But before she could get to her feet, the mayor's wife said, what a beautiful cake. Alice, who was still stunned, sat back in her chair when she heard the hostess, who was a prominent church member, say, well, thank you. I baked it myself. Alice smiled and thought to herself, God is good. <laughs> ah, what a great story. Sometimes God does that. He turns the tables, doesn't he? You know, where does that phrase come from? It, it comes from uh, 17th century board games like chess and checkers when, you know, going from losing to winning. Sometimes in just, you know, one move, you go from losing to winning. And who doesn't like a, a story where the underdog comes out on top, where the losing team suddenly wins the big game, when the person with impossible obstacles overcomes them and comes out the winner? I don't know if you saw what happened at the Kentucky Derby yesterday, but, but the, the horse that won um, was disqualified for some technical thing. And so the one in second place became the winner, which was, wasn't even supposed to be close. had long odds on that horse, and he became the winner. But sometimes things like that happen. Um, when I was doing fiction writing training with Jerry, Jerry Jenkins, he, he said this, he said, to write a good story, put your hero in an apparent impossible situation and then come up with a creative way, an unexpected way to get him out. When we look at the story of Joseph, we can see that. It would, it would make a great fiction story, but it is true. It's a true story. So let's recap a little bit where we were last week. This scrappy, bratty, daddy's favorite, mouthy kid ticked his brothers off and uh, with his stories, his wild stories about his dreams, about his brothers and his parents bowing down to him. Envy between them um, 
kept festering, and, and over a period of time, they hated this boy, and they got so bad that they wanted to kill him. But they wind up selling him to a group of slave traders who took him down to Egypt and sold him in the slave auction where the king's official Potiphar bought him. We saw how he got seduced by Potiphar's wife who falsely accused him and he got thrown into prison. And I'm sure there were times when he looked back on his life and he thought about his brothers and he blamed everything that happened to him on his brothers. He's, he's like, I am here because of what my brothers did to me. Well, in prison, he quickly becomes the most trusted prisoner and puts in charge of all the other prisoners. And, and we talked about last week how he interpreted some dreams of the cupbearer and the baker. And for, through that, was brought to Pharaoh to interpret his dreams. And now we find that he interpreted those dreams for seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. And Pharaoh puts him in charge of all of Egypt. Now, you talk about turning the tables going from a forgotten prisoner to the person second in command in all of Egypt. That's turning the tables, changing one's position from misfortune to fortune. So a couple things that I want to talk about this morning that we can learn from this story. If you've got your notes there, the first thing I want to talk about is God turns the tables when we are faithful, when we are faithful. Over and over it says that God was with Joseph. Well, why was God with Joseph? I believe it's because Joseph was with God. No matter where he went, no matter what happened in his life, he remembered where he came from. He remembered that he belonged to God. Even in this pagan, godless society, he still honored God. He honored God by not yielding to temptation uh, when Potiphar's wife seduced him. You know, here's the difference between Joseph and most people. Most men, even if they, even if they resisted the temptation, would say, what if we get caught? What if your husband finds out? But I want you to notice what Joseph said. Joseph said, How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And sin against God. Does that cross your mind whenever you resist temptation, when you're temptation, tempted to sin? You are sinning against the God of the universe. That's what Joseph understood. That sin wasn't just, you know, trying to stay away from something so you wouldn't get caught. It was, he was sinning against God if he, if he yielded to that temptation. You know, for Joseph, the more, most important thing in his life was his relationship with God. Even as a slave in a foreign land, even when he was in prison, the most important thing to him that he was with God, or that he was... Um, honored God. And because of that, it says God was with Joseph. You know, I remember when I was a kid hearing about a guy by the name of Richard Warmbrand. He was a pastor in Romania that was uh, arrested when the Russian communists came in and took over Romania in 1945. He was thrown into prison. He was tortured for 10 years. His family thought he was dead. He was finally re released, but he never stopped witnessing to his captors. He was hating the evil system. It's what he said. You hate the evil system, but you love the people. You love the people that had put him there. In May 1966, he testified before the U.S. Senate International Security Subcommittee, where he stripped to the waist and he showed the marks on his body where he'd been tortured in that prison in Romania. He started a group called the Voice of the Martyrs, a worldwide organization that still today shines a spotlight on uh, Christians being tortured for their faith. You know, it's appalling to me that so many today are clamoring for socialism in the United States, the very system that put a guy like Richard Warmbrand in prison. I saw an article Friday that said persecution of Christians is at near genocide levels. All around the world, not just in Islamist countries, but in others as well, like North Korea, China, India. Uh, another from Open Doors USA says, the last five years, Christian persecution has increased every year. Last year was up 14% from the previous year. It's at record levels, record levels all over the country. 
Um, I don't know if you saw this video that's been on Facebook this past week of uh, kids in a mosque in Philadelphia who are singing songs about cutting off the heads of Christians and fighting for the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem. You think it won't happen here? It definitely will happen here if something doesn't change. Why am I saying this? Because Joseph found himself in a situation in a foreign land, in prison, and still honored God. We see that today with Christians all over the world. I know we, we've got it pretty nice here. We've got it pretty nice here, but let me tell you, it's coming. It's coming where we'll face some of those things in the end. But God can turn the tables if we remain faithful. In fact, if we read the last chapter in the book, we find out that we win. We win. God turns the tables. The second thing I want to talk about is God turns the tables when we give him credit. We see another glimpse of Joseph's character is how he responded to Pharaoh. When Pharaoh came, he said, can you interpret my dream? And Joseph didn't say, well, yes, I can. I'm the dream doctor. He said, I can't, but God can. He gave God the credit for it. Now, do you think God would have brought him out of prison if his mindset would have still been what that bratty little kid was that you're all going to bow down to me? Something had changed. Something had changed in Joseph's life to the point where he says, I'm not taking credit for it. I'm giving God the credit for it. Joseph had changed. You know, hardships have a way of doing that, don't they? They have a way of humbling us, of building our character. Psalm 37, 4 says, Take the light in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. So that brings us up to speed to where we are today, to where we find us today. There's been seven years of plenty in Egypt. And under Joseph's management, the people had brought 20% of their crops to Joseph, and Joseph had stored them. They found these huge uh, granaries in Egypt where they think they stored that grain during that time. So over the seven-year period, they stored a lot of grain. And then the famine came, not just in Egypt, but all around the Middle East. Uh, the famine came, and people were starting to get desperate. So let's pick up the story in chapter 42. When Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, Why do you just keep looking at each other? He continued, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us, so that we may live and not die. Then ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with the others because he was afraid that harm might come to him. So Israel's sons were among those who went to buy grain, for there was famine in the land of Canaan also. Now Joseph was the governor of the land, the person who sold grain to all its people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. As, Joseph's, as soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them. But he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where do you come from? He asked. From the land of Canaan, they replied, to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Then he remembered his dreams about them and said to them, You are spies. You have come to see where our land is unprotected. No, my lord, they answered. Your servants have come to buy food. We are all the sons of one man. Your servants are honest men, not spies. <laughs> I wonder what was going through Joseph's mind when they said that. We're honest men. Joseph's like, yeah, right. <laughs> I'm sure he remembered what they'd done to him. They had sold him into slavery and told his father that he was dead. They, and they're, oh, we're honest men. Sure you are. But notice what Joseph does. He's going to test them. No, he said to them, you have come to see where our land is unprotected. But they replied, your servants were 12 brothers, the sons of one man who lives in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now with our father and one is no more. Joseph then said to them, it is just as I told you, you are spies. And this is how you will be tested. As surely as Pharaoh lives, you will not leave this place unless your younger brother comes here. Send one of your number to get your brother. The rest of you will be kept in prison so that your words may be tested to see if you are telling the truth. If you are not, then as surely as Pharaoh lives, you are spies. And he put them all in custody for three days. 
On the third day, Joseph said to them, Do this, and you will live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers stay here in prison, while the rest of you go and take grain back for your starving households. But you must bring your youngest brother to me, so that your words may be verified, and that you may not die. This they proceeded to do. They said to one another, Surely we are being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but we would not listen. That's why this distress has come on us. Think about this. Something that happened 20 years ago all of a sudden comes to their mind. Surely we are being punished because of what we did to our brother. Isn't that funny how guilt works? We'll talk about that more later. Reuben replied, didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy? But you wouldn't listen. Now we must give an accounting for his blood. Now here's, here's an interesting, interesting verse. They did not realize that Joseph could understand them since he was using an interpreter. So they were talking Hebrew. And uh, Joseph was speaking in whatever language the Egyptians speak in. And uh, they didn't realize he understood everything that, he, everything that they said. He turned away from them and began to weep. But that came back and spoke to them again. He had Simeon taken from them and bound before their eyes. Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain, to put each man's silver back in his sack, and to give them provisions for their journey. After this was done for them, they loaded their grain in the, on their donkeys and left. At the place where they stopped for the night, one of them opened his sack to get feed for his donkey, and he saw his silver in the mouth of his sack. My silver has been returned, he said to his brothers. Here it is in my sack. Their hearts sank, and they turned to each other, trembling, and said, What is this that God has done to us? When they came to their father, Jacob, in the land of Canaan, they told him all that had happened to them. They said, The man who is Lord over the land spoke harshly to us and treated us as though we were spying on the land. But we said to him, we are honest men. We are not spies. We were tell twelve brothers, sons of one father. One is no more, and the youngest is now with our father in Canaan. Then the man who is lord over the land said to us, This is how I will know whether you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers here with me, and take food for your starving households, and go. But bring your youngest brother to me, so I will know that you are not spies, but honest men. Then I will give your brother back to you, and you can trade in the land." As they were emptying their sacks, there in each man's sack was his pouch of silver. When they and their father saw the money pouches, they were frightened. Their father Jacob said to them, You have deprived me of my children. Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more, and now you want to take Benjamin. Everything is against me. Then Reuben said to his father, You may put both of my sons to death if I do not bring him back to you. Entrust him to my care, and I will bring him back. But Jacob said, My son will not go down there with you. His brother is dead, and he is the only one left. If harm comes to him on your journey you are taking, you will bring my gray head down to the grave in sorrow. Imagine being there in those in that situation what what do you think was going through joseph's mind when he saw his brothers now it was his turn he was in a position of power and authority the tables had been turned he had the power to do anything he wanted to his brothers oh revenge is sweet sometimes isn't it a couple things i want to point out here First one is broken trust is extremely difficult to repair. It's extremely difficult to repair. Proverbs twenty five nineteen says, Confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a bad tooth and a foot out of joint. <laughs> it's painful, in other words. If you had a bad tooth, it's painful. Um, and it's very difficult to repair. I want you to notice that Joseph didn't just jump right in and welcome his brothers. He was skeptical. These were the same guys that had sold him into slavery, who had threatened to kill him. When trust is broken, it is extremely difficult to get it back. Joseph is wise. He wants to know if he can trust his brothers. He wants to know if they've, if they've changed. He knows they've been liars in the past. He wants to know if they can be trusted. So he 
puts them through a series of tests. First of all, he puts their silver back into their bags. He wants to know if they're going to be honest enough to bring it back to him. Um, he holds one of the brothers in prison. Why? Because he wants to know if they'll, if they'll just leave him there and sell out their brother like they did him. He wants to know if they're going to abandon Simeon. Have they changed? Are they trustworthy? You know, if someone cons you, someone swindles you, someone steals for you, from you, someone treats you badly, it's okay to be skeptical of that person, all right? You can forgive someone and still be skeptical. I remember um, on the farm when I was a kid, we'd have salesmen come by all the time, you know, be trying to sell something. And uh, I remember dad, one of his dad's favorite comments was, you know, I don't trust that guy, father, and I can throw him. And uh, he was always nice and courteous, and, uh, but he didn't buy his snake oil or whatever he was selling. Uh, he was skeptical many times. So that, that's the first thing I want you to understand. Broken trust is extremely difficult to repair. Uh, another thing is that God uses guilt to motivate us. Notice, notice how the brothers felt guilty about something that happened so long ago. Isn't it funny that that's the first thing that they thought of? That God is punishing us for what we did to Joseph. They didn't know it was Joseph in front of them. Has that ever happened to you? You meet up with someone you haven't seen for a long time, and all of a sudden you get flashbacks of something that happened a long time ago. Maybe something that you'd done, something that you'd said a long time ago. God uses guilt to motivate us to change. You know, David, after he had committed adultery with his neighbor's wife, he wrote these words in Psalms. He said, My guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. My wounds fester and are loathsome because of my sinful folly. I am bowed down and brought very low. All day long I go about mourning. My back is filled with searing pain. There is no health in my body. I am feeble and utterly crushed. I groan in anguish of heart. Why does God allow us to have guilt? To motivate us to change. To motivate us to do something different. If we never felt guilty, we would never have an incentive to change. Now, I want you to notice what Joseph did after he heard them talking about this. It says he turned away from them, verse 24, and began to weep. Why did Joseph weep? Imagine the emotions that he was feeling. His family that he thought he would never see again. They were probably mixed emotions. There was probably tears of joy at seeing them. There was tears of sadness because of the years of rejection he had felt from them. Tears of anger that they were so evil. Tears of hope that he would see his father again. All those mixed emotions. So his emotions just began to boil over and he wept. Have any of you ever done that? Maybe at a wedding. You have all these mixed emotions, and there's emotions of joy and, and maybe some sadness. And um, I remember when, when Jesse got married, you know, it was an emotional day for me because it was, you know, our, our daughter was growing up and leaving home. And, and uh, so it was, it was sadness for that, yet it was joy for for her to move on and get married. And, and then, of course, then there was Gary, you know. <laughs> Great. Love Gary. Love Gary. Great. <laughs> Just got to give him a hard time. But, you know, there's all these mixed emotions. I imagine that's what Joseph was feeling at that point. All those mixed emotions. And, and then, of course, there was his... Uh, thinking about possibly being able to see his younger brother, Benjamin, his only um, full brother, Benjamin. Let's, let's go on to chapter 45 and read a few verses in chapter 45. This now brings us to some time later, possibly a year later, when the, the boys come the second time to see Joseph. 
um, 45 verse 1 says, they had come and they had come to, to see him again. It says, then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants. And he cried out, have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him and Pharaoh's household heard all about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Yeah, I would think so. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. Number three, God turns the tables when we trust him. God turns the tables when we trust him. In Genesis chapter 50, Joseph said to them, he said, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. You know, God gives us a lot of room to make decisions individually, um, to kind of control our own destiny. But in the grand scene of life, the grand scheme of things, He's still in control. Joseph had learned to trust God for his future. He saw the bigger picture, how God manipulated events, how God manipulated things so that he was at the right place at the right time. He was there for the right purpose, saving a whole generation of people from starvation. See, Joseph trusted God in every situation he faced. From prison to being ruler in government, he saw the big picture. Psalm 118 says, It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. We see this exemplified throughout Joseph's life where he trusted in God. And now, now all of a sudden, he can see the big picture and he can see why God had put him in that place. Some of you may have experienced that throughout your life how God has put you in a certain place, even though you didn't know it at the time. You didn't know that what you were going through was preparing you for what God had for you. But God works in, in great ways to manipulate the events to bring us to where we need to be. Which brings us to number four. God turns the tables when we leave the revenge to him. This is probably the hardest thing to do. See, Joseph was able to forgive his brothers for what they had done to him because he trusted God to avenge the wrong. These verses, these next few verses I'm going to share with you go against every fiber in the human being. <laughs> Everything that we want to do. In Romans, it says, Dear friends, never avenge yourselves. Leave that to God, for it is written, I will take vengeance. I will repay those who deserve it, says the Lord. Instead, do what the scriptures say. If your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. And they will be ashamed of what they have done to you. Don't let evil get the best of you, but conquer evil by doing good. Think about Joseph and what he did with his brothers. He had the power. He had the ability to take revenge on his brothers. He could have done anything he wanted to to his brothers. After all, they had been very mean to him. But what did he do? He fed them. He invited them into his house and he fed them. He gave them something to drink. And because of that, they were ashamed of what they had done. 
You know, where we get in trouble is when we think we can control that ourselves, when we think that we have to have revenge ourselves, and we think we have to, we have to um, avenge the wrongs that have been done to us. Now, I'm guessing everyone in this room can think of someone who has hurt you, someone who has treated you badly, someone who has offended you, maybe someone who has cheated you, or whatever the case may be. You know, I, I, I know I can. I've been, I've been swindled in business. I've been falsely accused as a pastor. I've been lied to, cheated, you name it. And I've not always responded correctly. I'm learning to let go and let God do it. You know, just say, God, you get them. God, you get them. Just turn it over to God and let him handle it. Let's learn from Joseph. Be willing to forgive those who have broken your trust. Let God be the avenger. And that takes a special kind of commitment. Special kind of commitment. You know, God is the master at turning the tables. Taking something that appears to be bad and turning it into something good. We see that throughout the scriptures. We think about people like, in the Bible, like Esther who was in a bad situation, who was in a foreign land in Babylon, but God raised her up for a special time to save her people. We think of Daniel again in Babylon, who God used in a mighty way to write prophecy that we can learn from today. We think of Nehemiah. We think of David, a strapping little um, shepherd boy who became a king. We think of people like Gideon and Samson. But ultimately, we see it in Jesus Christ. We see it who, in Jesus Christ who was crucified on a cross. Something that looked terribly, horribly bad. Where Satan had motivated a crowd to come up against him. This crowd of evil people and, and put him on a cross. And Satan thought, man, I've won now. But God turned the tables, didn't he? Three days later, he turned the tables. And he used that to bring salvation to the world. And we will see it again. We will see it again. The Bible says that there's coming a time in the last days when we'll see the world getting darker and darker. An increase in the persecution of God's people like I talked about just earlier. I don't know if you're aware, but in the last two days, there have been 450 rockets from Gaza fired into Israel again. They're in war again over there. But he reminds us in Luke 21, 28, he says, Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Jesus is going to turn the tables one more time. He's going to turn the tables one more time. And we're going to see him coming in the clouds. And he's going to come for his bride. See, I like these words in the Bible. Two words, but God. No matter how things look, it's always but God. But God intervenes. He's going to turn the tables. He's done it so many times before. He can do it again. He can do it in your life. No matter what you're facing, but God. God can turn the tables. He loves to do that. He loves to do that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you that you are a God who learns, loves to turn the tables. You love to take something that looks bad and turn it into something good. You do it over and over and over again. If we'll be faithful to you, if we'll trust in you, if we'll just follow your word, you will do it for us. We thank you for each one that's here. Pray, God, that as we go from this place today, you would help us that whatever we do throughout this week, that we would honor and glorify you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.